Welcome everyone to today's episode of Places, People, Purpose. In yesterday's episode, we saw that the French effort to build the canal ended in bankruptcy and turmoil in February of 1889. Today, we're going to look at how the U.S. took over the canal project and the many challenges it faced and had to overcome. There are many fascinating stories to share with you today, so let's get started. The story of the United States construction of the Panama Canal is a saga of engineering brilliance, public health challenges, diplomatic maneuvering, and the pursuit of strategic interests. It all started by the U.S. buying the French assets for the canal. The U.S. paid $40 million for 30,000 acres of land, the Panama Railroad, more than 2,000 buildings, the central headquarters in Panama City, and the hospitals located in Cologne and Panama City. In January of 1990, Congress authorized President Theodore Roosevelt to acquire the French company's Panama assets at a cost not to exceed $40 million. It wasn't until 1902 that Congress passed the Spooner Act, which authorized the U.S. government to proceed with canal construction with the choice of route left to the discretion of the president. There had been significant debate over whether the canal should be sited in Panama or Nicaragua. In 1903, No agreement had yet been signed with Colombia for the canal construction, and the negotiations had been slow, difficult, and contentious. When the proposed Ayaran Treaty went before the Colombian Senate on August 12th, it was unanimously rejected. Shortly thereafter, a group of Panamanian nationalists sought independence from Colombia Seeing this as a chance to gain more favorable terms for canal construction, the United States provided support for Panama's push for independence. On November 3, 1903, Panama declared its sovereignty, and the United States formally recognized Panama as an independent republic on November 6. With Panama now independent, Negotiations between the two nations led to the signing of the Hay Bonao Varia Treaty on November 18, 1903. Named after Philippe Bonao Varia, a French engineer and Secretary of State, John Hay, the treaty granted the United States control over a zone stretching 10 miles wide across the isthmus. This zone encompassed the land on which the canal would be built. The treaty stipulated that the U.S. would have the authority to construct, operate, and manage the canal while guaranteeing Panamanian independence. In return, Panama received a $10 million payment and subsequent annual payments of $250,000. A controversial provision stated that even though the United States was not the sovereign within the canal, it could act like one. Also, it was stipulated that the United States would hold the canal zone in perpetuity. After securing the necessary rights and treaties, the U.S. began construction of the Panama Canal in 1904. President Roosevelt then issued instructions to find the best medical man in the country to operate the hospitals and sanitary work in Panama. As a result, Dr. William Gorgas was hired for the job and played a pivotal role in improving sanitary conditions and mortality rates in the canal zone. Gorgas would focus on yellow fever first. Malaria was the larger threat but yellow fever was his specialty. Gorgas knew that the carrier for yellow fever was a certain species of mosquito. Unfortunately, the isthmus was a paradise for mosquitoes. With warm weather and rainy seasons, 
that would leave many pools of standing water. In addition, the windows for buildings did not have screens, and since the houses did not have running water, they kept outdoor cisterns to catch rainwater. In other words, the existing environment was very attractive for mosquitoes. Unfortunately, certain individuals in supervisory positions would not believe that mosquitoes could be the cause of yellow fever or malaria. As a result, Gorgas did not receive supplies, financial, or other support he needed to be successful. The first case of yellow fever was reported on November 21. In December, there were six more cases, and in January, an additional eight. Within months, a sense of alarm spread among Americans on the isthmus, and this fear eventually led to three-quarters of the Americans on the isthmus leaving to go back to the United States. Then a change in leadership for the canal project occurred, with John Stevens taking over for John Wallace as chief engineer. Stevens and Gorgas got along well, resulting in Gorgas finally getting the support he needed. Between May 1 and August 31, 1905, yellow fever took 47 lives. During the same time, twice as many people died of malaria, 49 of pneumonia, and 46 of dysentery. Panama was fumigated one house at a time, and the same thing was done in Cologne. The cities in the canal zone were also provided with running water, which meant that open cisterns of water could be disposed of. Eradicating yellow fever in Panama took a year and a half, but once Gorgas' program began, there was a dramatic reduction in yellow fever cases, and by December 1906, yellow fever had disappeared from the isthmus. It is estimated that 5,609 workers died during the U.S. construction of the Panama Canal. Gorgas later stated that if conditions had remained as they were, the death toll would have been over 78,000 people. In addition to improving health care, that the Panama Railway was a critical asset for moving men, food, supplies, and everything else needed to make progress with the canal project. He had the railway upgraded so that it was capable of moving much heavier and frequent loads. The railroad was used to transport excavation equipment, machinery, construction materials, and laborers to various locations along the canal route. It significantly facilitated the movement of resources, which was crucial for the construction effort. Stevens also tripled the workforce within six months of taking over, and by the end of 1906, there were almost 24,000 men at work on the canal. The labor force came from 97 different countries. Many of these laborers remained in Panama after the canal was finished, which gave Panama a cultural diversity that is still present today. Stevens was also a critical proponent of changing the design of the canal from a sea level canal to a lock spaced canal. Stevens had seen the effect of the rains on the Chagres River and how dramatically it expanded. He proved to be an effective advocate in convincing Congress that a lock space plan was necessary for the canal to be successful. In November of 1906, President Roosevelt traveled to Panama with his wife to see firsthand how things were progressing. He chose November to travel as he wanted to see Panama at its absolute worst weather-wise. Reportedly, he said he was not disappointed. Although the trip went well and Roosevelt was pleased with the progress, he received a letter from Stevens the following February, which he took as a resignation. It was generally believed that Stevens was exhausted and on the verge of a breakdown. In any event, his resignation was accepted and George Gothels was named as his replacement. 
When the work under Gothel's command was at its peak, the workers were excavating the equivalent of a Suez Canal every three years. By the end of 1907, there were 32,000 people on the payroll. By 1910, there was almost 40,000. Construction of the canal would require more than 61 million pounds of dynamite, more than had been used in all of America's wars until that point in time. The workforce during the last years of construction was between 45 to 50,000. White North Americans comprised only 6,000 and approximately 2,500 of these were women and children. That's the end of our episode for today. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Tomorrow, we will cover an exciting moment in history with the completion of the canal. So please join us tomorrow for our next episode of Places, People, Purpose, where we create connections to our world.